Welcome to Warner College Natural Resources, uh, second day of a career in diversity chat, a chat with natural resource professionals. This is day number two. Yesterday we had a phenomenal day uh, with five re re natural resource professionals to talk about uh, their entities, their organizations, how you thrive in the organizations, the challenges and changes that they've uh, adapted through COVID, why diversity is important and some of the challenges and changes within diversity metrics and efforts within their institutions. Today with day two, we're gonna go in similar fashion, but we bring it to you brand new uh, panelists to talk about their experiences, their positions, how they ended up in their position, the things that they're working on, and we're also going to talk about diversity and the efforts uh, that they're utilizing within the organizations to make diversity a prominent figure and talked about discussion. Again, thank you again for tuning in to Colorado State's day two of a conversation with natural resource professionals. Um, and so here we get started. So before we get started officially, I want to make sure that we first do an land acknowledgement uh, here at Colorado State. Uh, we wanted to provide the understanding that CSU acknowledges with respect that the lands we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, uh, Cheyenne, uh, Shawnee, and Ute Nation and people. This is also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native tribes. We recognize the indigenous peoples, our original stewards of this land, and all their relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. So thank you with that. So uh, as we get started today, I wanna give a brief introduction to our panelists and then they will go and add uh, their own intros with this as well. So uh, starting first, I wanna introduce Crystal Eagley, who works for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Then we also have today, uh, Sherry Fountain, who works with the US Forest Service. We have Jeremy Duetto, who works with uh, GEI Consulting. We have Michaela Ola, Olis, um, forgive me if I messed up your last name, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. And then we have uh, Dr. Alexandria Sutton Lawrence, the Wilderness Society. Um, so I've provided a brief introduction. These dynamic individuals are going to share their time and experiences with us today. But I'm going to go ahead and start with Crystal first, and then I'll name off. I'm going to go Crystal, then Sherry, Jeremy, Michaela, and then Alexandria. And I want you to answer this first question um, to provide a little bit more of an intro for yourself for about two or three minutes. So please tell us who you are, how you ended up in your, uh, your profession, how you found your passion in this profession, and the work that you're currently doing and the role you're serving in your profession. So we'll start off with Crystal. Hi, my name is Crystal Egley. I'm a videographer for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. I actually started my career out in Los Angeles as a film editor, and I spent 10 years out there thinking that that was going to be how I pursued my dream, you know, getting an Academy Award, hopefully, for, for film editing. And it turns out that that's not even remotely the lifestyle that I wanted to live. And I grew up in rural Vermont, so Los Angeles was a bit of a culture shock. And it, it took me 10 years to leave. And then I came to Colorado and I didn't wanna do film anymore. But then I found this job at Colorado Parks and Wildlife and I discovered conservation, conservation organization, wildlife management, state parks. And I just fell in love with telling the stories of conservation organizations. I am. I cannot believe the amazing work we do. So that's kind of the short version of how I got here. And now my job is to tell the stories of Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, Sherry. Hi, everyone. I'm Sherry Fountain. I'm the Urban and Community Forestry Forest Stewardship Program Manager for Region 2, which is Colorado, Nebraska, Wyoming, Kansas, and I think that's all. So I started in oil and gas, and that was not where I wanted to be. My background is in urban and community forestry. I have a degree in urban forestry, and I took a job with the Forest Service as an oil and gas administrator, um, working on special uses, and then fast forward forward 17 years later I have landed my dream job as an urban and forestry community program manager with the Forest Service where I um, give financial assistance to the states to help them 
plant trees, conserve water, and create um, a healthy lifestyle, outdoor lifestyle in urban areas for the general public. And thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, Jeremy. Yeah, my name is Jeremy Duto, and I'm a senior engineer with uh, GEI Consultants here in Fort Collins, Colorado. I uh, graduated from Warner uh, College of Natural Resources in uh, the year 2000 with a degree in geology, um, and then not really knowing where I wanted to go with that, um, I immediately just started working for a, for a consulting engineering firm, um, kind of the, the on the lowest of the low end, um, and really liked the industry and, and slowly worked my way up over the last 20 years, um, basically taking any, any, any job and any education, any, any experience that I could get. Um, and throughout the time, I, I certified myself as a professional geologist and then was able to qualify to uh, certify as a professional engineer. So um, now I'm a, currently a senior engineer, senior and en senior engineer and a senior geologist for uh, GEI consultants. And I, I primarily work on um, dams and levees and rock slide stabilizations, as well as um, mine reclamation and development. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Michaela. Hi, everyone. I'm Michaela Oles. Um, I work for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I work in Region 6, and that covers Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Montana, North and South Dakota, Kansas, and Nebraska. Um, I work in the Regional Office in External Affairs. My title is Public Affairs Specialist, but basically um, what I do is social media management, photography, storytelling, graphic design and layout, whole bunch of communication stuff. Um, I'm actually a recent graduate, so proof right here that you can get a job right out of college. Um, I graduated in 2018 from Warner College as well. Um, basically, what got me interested in this, I couldn't decide if I wanted to do biology or if I wanted to do business marketing. So luckily, Warner had a program that kind of mixed both of them together. So um, yeah, now I get to tell all of the cool conservation stories that happen in the field. Um, yeah, so that's what I do. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Lawrence. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Uh, so I am Alexa Sutton Lawrence, and I spent about a year at the Natural Resource Ecology Laboratory when I first started my PhD. That was back in 2011. I want to, nope. 2009 <laughs> to 10. And I actually ended up getting my PhD from Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment in 2017. Did an energy policy postdoc and now, and then spent some time working for Duke University. Now I am the Southeast Regional Director for the Wilderness Society. And so my work focuses on identifying and finding creative ways to preserve wild spaces across uh, North America and to inspire people to care about these places. Um, I bring into my work a really intense focus on marginalized communities, specifically African American and indigenous communities. Both are part of my personal heritage and so are very significant to me. Um, and so that is the uh, focus of my work and kind of where I, how I got to where I am today. I, also did my undergrad at Howard, which I can never forget to say, and I did a master's at Texas A&M, and um, yeah, and I'm African American and out of the Ohio supporting people. So. Thank you very much. And so, um, as you can tell, early off, just as of yesterday, um, as well, we have a very diverse panel, a uh, very wide range of experiences and professions. So um, number one, just to let you know for students out there listening today that um, the natural resource pathway can be vast and many uh, opportunities to pursue your passion and careers in natural resources. So uh, buckle up as we get ready for this great discussion. Again, you're tuning into uh, day number two of our natural resource uh, chat with uh, natural resource professional, a chat with diversity and, um, and careers. Ah, can't get that tongue tied. Um, so, 
Here we go. First question. We're going to start going backwards on this one. So I'm going to start with Dr. Lawrence and we're going to work backwards in this order. So the very first question that a lot of our students want to know is help us to understand how students can prepare themselves for a career with your agency. What experiences or skills should students gain or develop to make themselves stand out as applicants and be desirable, especially during the time of COVID-19? Sure. Uh, so I would say there's kind of two sets of skills that I have found to be the most useful for students to cultivate. There's a set of soft skills and then there's a set of kind of hard skills. And I, I actually hate that language for the distinction, but really what it is is a set of skills that are rooted in sort of the art of working with people and the art of reading and understanding situations that includes adaptability that includes uh, cultural fluency and cultural conscientiousness, that includes all of the skills that would make you a good teammate or eventually a good manager or a good leader. So being sensitive to what other people's needs are, being able to see things from perspectives other than your own, really cultivating a genuine set of skills in those areas. That becomes really important. Those are skills transferable to so many positions and they're ones that are really hard to teach. Right? It's gotta be something that's really sort of self-cultivated over time. I would say uh, in terms of kind of what are the hard skills, you probably, students probably already know a lot of them. You know, it helps to be good at GIS. It helps to at least have some basic GIS skills. Uh, no matter what you're doing, a lot of the work that I do now, even though it's really heavily focused on supporting communities and advocacy, it also uses a huge spatial analysis component. Understanding where people have connected to landscape and how and what that means gives me a whole toolbox that I can draw on. And I find that across my field. I would say in addition, being an excellent writer and communicator is very important. Um, I would also highlight um, probably to be honest, stats hasn't been as important for me as I thought it would be when I was doing my master's. But, uh, but definitely the spatial analysis language skills have actually been really, really, really crucial for me. Before I came back to the US when I was doing my dissertation work in particular, I was living in the Maasai Mara um, with the Maasai community. And I was using my college Swahili um, to get by, but I found that I was in such a rural place that a lot of people didn't even speak Swahili, which is something you learn in school um, in most parts of Kenya. And so I had to very quickly pick up local languages, a little bit of Kima, a little bit of Kikuyu, and being able to do that made me much more effective in my job. It's kind of the same thing even with my work here in the States is being able to pick up on the ways that people communicate differently in different regions and different places and in different cultural communities is absolutely essential. So I would say that even starts to merge back into those soft skills, right? Of how you read and respond to people. Thank you. Uh, Michaela. Hi, okay. So like I said, US Fish and Wildlife Service is a federal agency. I'm sure as students, you guys have been told many times that it's kind of hard to get your foot in the door with those. Um, but the way I did it, Basically, I utilized my career services a lot. I'm guessing you guys know who Leanna Biddle is. She's your career advisor. If you don't know who she is, get to know her because she's amazing and she will put you on the right path and get you all the help you need. Um, as a student, I would highly recommend applying for internships, specifically with US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, just because that's how I got my foot in the door. It wasn't things that I thought I wanted to do. Um, it was actually the first one I had to move to Michigan for a summer and I did not want to move. I didn't want to do the job description that was there, but you just got to kind of got to go out of your comfort zone and apply for things that you don't really want to do or you think you might not want to do because that's kind of how I found out exactly that that's what I loved to do. Um, so yeah, use your career services, apply for internships, volunteer. Actually in Fort Collins, well technically Carr, Colorado, we have the National Black-Footed Ferret Center and um, they take volunteers all the time. I don't think they are right now, obviously, because we're supposed to be social distancing and stuff, but um, when that gets back, just volunteer, apply for internships, um, get to know your career services and you should be well on your way. Leanna Biddle is really good at teaching you how to use USA Jobs. Uh, that's how you have to apply to all federal positions. It's kind of a beast and it's kind of dumb, but you got to figure out how to do it if you want to get a job with the federal agencies. So um, yeah, that's the advice I have. <laughs> 
Thank you, Michaela. Keep it real and keep it playing. Let the students know what they need to know. That's what I like. All right, uh, Jeremy. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll second what Michaela and Alexander said. It's, you know, getting yourself out there and, and, and being flexible and, and being adaptable into many different situations is very important. So, you know, day by day at any job you're going to have, the weirdest things can get thrown at you. And if you can handle those, um, if you develop those skills now, you'll be able to translate those into employment and, and, and it'll be evident to, to people who are interviewing you. Um, cause I, I personally like to throw curveballs in, in when I interview and, um, it's a good read on how people, you know, can handle, uh, adversity and, and curveballs. And I would say that just kind of, for lack of a better term, be that guy, be that gal, go, go out and do whatever you can that interests you in your, your field, in your industry. And, and, and like Michaela said, even if it's, if it's some, somewhere out of town or if it's, somewhere that you don't want to go or not something that's your dream job description, you know, it, it, take it anyways. If it's, if it's either that or, or, or working at a restaurant all summer, I'll tell you that, that, that doing, doing something mildly close to your field is, is hugely more valuable than, than working at a restaurant all summer, even if it's not exactly what you want to do. Um, maybe, you know, you check that off your list and yes, that's definitely not what I want to do. Or maybe as McKenna said, maybe it's something you do find out that, wow, I actually really like this. And, you know, when you know everybody says that they want somebody with experience and, and how do you get experience if you don't just go and just do whatever it takes to 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 get that experience um and and now as alexandra said yes writing um be a be a be a good writer it's 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 painful sometimes in in my industry and i'm an engineer consulting engineer and we do a lot of writing and and you can you know, I can I do a lot of reviewing now, and I can pick up a, a a report that that somebody has has written that I can tell that they're not a very good writer at all, and 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 my red pen bleeds all over their paper, and I send it back to them, and it's so refreshing to get back uh, a review something where it's like, oh yeah, exactly, that's that's you know exactly what I would have said or how I would have said it, or or lots of times even oh I didn't even think about it that way. That's refreshing in my in 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 my industry. Um, so that's that I think that's hugely important. And, um, you know, as Alexandra said, GIS, yes, but if you're considering more in the engineering field, um, AutoCAD is a definite, um, not a must, but if you can get any sort of AutoCAD experience on your own uh, through some free versions or taking some classes through, through the school or even independently, um, that's a way to get a leg up is, is, is AutoCAD being, being mildly proficient. In it. It, it takes a long time, but it's a, it's a good uh, skill to have. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, already we're seeing a similar theme of what was uh, stated yesterday as far as being willing to take uh, any kind of experience uh, possible to put you on the right path and trajectory for your passion. Um, going off of what Michaela stated, you know, coming out of school, we had a lot of students um, that we talked to, to yesterday who mentioned, you know, they thought they could just go in straight to like a junior level position. And it's like, no, you have to kind of pay your dues and be willing to go to these rural areas. So I'm glad to hear that we're already starting off that realization for today's session as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to let Sherry continue and then finish up with Crystal. I think everyone has spoken basically on everything that you need to do, but one thing I would say is make sure that you're flexible, open and to doing other things outside of your desired occupation that will help you grow. And then it'll also show your managers that you are capable of doing other things and learning from other ways of, of uh, other opportunities and that will help you uh, along the way as well and also make sure that ask questions don't be afraid to ask questions even if you think it's dumb it might not be something that someone else had, or someone else may be thinking ask those questions to your managers talk with other employees in the uh, area that you're working in the office that you're working in don't be afraid to socialize those are some things that you will learn that you'll pick up on conversations go play golf people don't believe in playing golf and it's a helpful little uh, tidbit for you go and do activities with the you know the programs that be be flexible and just be willing to to 
emerge yourself into the agency you're working in and that way you'll have a better opportunity of knowing what's out there and how you can benefit from those other opportunities that are not in your face um, currently being presented to you thank you sherry and to finish off crystal uh, everybody took a lot of the things I was going to say, so I'm going to try to add something uh, different, but I will just reiterate that everything everybody's saying is absolutely 100% on the nose. One of the things that we look for at Colorado Parks and Wildlife is people who want to work for our agency specifically, and that can be done by customizing your cover letter, and you'd be so amazed by how many people just write like, Dear sir or madam, I'm a undergraduate. I have these skills and thank you for your time. Why do you wanna work for us is frequently missing from these things. We're so passionate about what we do. We want to hire people who, who you know, wanna be part of the club, you know? So take time to go to the organization's website, whatever it is, if it's CPW or somewhere else, learn what their values are, see how they align with your values and make that very, very clear in your cover letters and take the time to customize those cover letters. <laughs> um, I'm on the recruitment and retention committee as well at Colorado Parks and Wildlife. So we talk about hiring a lot. And one of the things that we wanna make sure everyone knows is that we're not just park rangers and law enforcement officers and uh, game wardens and biologists. We have engineers, we have, you know, GIS specialists very specifically, we have um, lawyers, we have everything. But the one thing that um, we do have a bias towards is people who are generally outdoorsy in nature, who love being outside, who are passionate about the overall mission of the organization. So if you go through school and you decide, wait, I, I wanna be a lawyer, you can still work in conservation. You can still combine those two together. You could still um, follow that passion and do a slightly different job. So don't give up uh, if you are on the fence about what to do, com combine, do it all. <laughs> and um, yeah, and also what everybody else said as well. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. Um, and yes, I got a note. Yes, I just want to uh, confirm and reaffirm to everybody, this is a recorded session. And so um, if you have friends or colleagues who weren't able to make this particular session to listen in today, it will be posted on YouTube, um, our YouTube channel, um, shortly after we finish the session today. So this will be a recorded session for everyone in attendance today. Um, going on to our next question. Oh, I always mess up when, with this mic. Okay, here we go. So you you each kind of touched on it. And so this is going to be more of the popcorn. So I'm going to let whoever wants to chime in on this question, chime in if they want to add more detail to it. But uh, specifically for our seniors and those students who are thinking about going into the workforce now, and it's very precarious and we don't know what's going to be happening. What is one piece of advice you would give students working towards obtaining experience or a career and natural re resources in the immediate future with the uncertainty that COVID provides. And remember, anybody can jump in on this one, so. I'll go. Uh, said, so okay. Under normal circumstances, I would tell people uh, the same, same thing that's been reiterated, which is we like to hire people we've already worked with. Uh, that means volunteering, temp positions, all that. And nobody is too good for those jobs. I, when I first started, I had 10 years of experience in Los Angeles. I was in the union. I was like, you know, I'm a baller, right? And I came back and to get my foot in the door at Colorado Parks Wildlife, I took an internship and I was doing things that I was doing 10 years earlier, you know? And so not being afraid to t check your ego and going at that ground level. However, now with COVID, <laughs> Uh, we do have a lot of volunteer opportunities that are not necessarily in the groups now, and we are working really hard to coordinate um, individual volunteer projects, things that can be done um, at home, and that's still Colorado Parks and Wildlife going on your resume, you know? It doesn't matter what you're doing. Some of our stuff is really boring data entry, some of it's closed captioning our videos, and it may not seem like it's that glamorous, you know, I'm I'm jumping on an elk to tranquilize it <laughs> thing with helicopters, but it puts CPW on your resume. And honestly, in, if, if 
that if you have time and the privilege to be able to take a volunteer position during COVID, uh, I would highly recommend it. Go ahead, Jeremy. I I was gonna say the exact same thing. I just 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 be available and and you know do what it takes. You know and 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 for each particular situation, what it takes is 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 vastly different at any given time and. Um, so you, you'll never know, but but keep your mind open and keep all opportunities in front of you um, and, and, and take advantage of, of what, you know, if you're a senior or junior or whatever, of what the school offers and, and the, the departments offer with respect to career fairs and and because a lot of employers do go to career fairs and, and I myself has, have attended them and, and you know, the, you, all, you get, you know, I'll, I'll get a thousand you know, resumes during a, a career fair, but every time there's like 10 people that stick out and they're, they're, they're the people that, that were, came dressed for the situation. They're the people that, 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 that went, walked up and already knew about my company and had some questions developed. Doesn't matter what kind of questions they were, but they were questions specific to my, the company that we were in or the industry or, or you know, intelligent questions. And, um, the good interpersonal skills as well. They, 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 they stand out and, and I, as I'm getting resumes, I will, I will make a note on the resume, you know, yes. And then lots of people come in and, and, you know, necessarily can't look me in the eye or, or don't even know, like, wait, what do you do again? You know, I'll take, I'll take your resume, but it'll get put on the bottom. Not to say that it's ruled out, but you know, if you're easier, it's easier to get hired if your resume is closer to the top. <laughs> That's true. So first impressions are key. And knowing yeah. the entity, I think uh, all of you all touched on, you know, just d do not um, apply for a job just because it's the shiny object. Apply for the job that aligns with your purpose and passion as an individual. And if you might have to do some grunt work and some hard work to get up to that position eventually, but um, kind of what was talked about yesterday is that you'll, you'll come with a more comprehensive understanding of what it takes and the experiences and the viewpoints at the various levels once you go through those uh, those experiences, and that that alone enrich, er, ah, enriches you as a supervisor or uh, fellow um, colleague as well. So just being mindful that to take your time. Um, it doesn't always come fast, but it comes when it needs to come. Uh, anyone else want to chime in on that question? What is one piece of advice you would give students towards? working towards uh, obtaining experience or career uh, in the immediate future, especially during the COVID? I'll jump in. Uh, so I think those were great, great things already that folks have talked about. Um, another thing I would suggest as a student, keep touch with professional societies in the field that you want to work in. I found uh, the professional societies for me, the Wildlife Society, Ecological Society of America, Society for Conservation Biology, Manners, uh, Minorities in Agriculture and Natural Resources and Related Sciences, and SACNES as well, uh, Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in the Sciences, and then even ISIS, uh, American Indian Scientists, Science and Engineering Society. Too many acronyms, <laughs> but I found all of those to be really, really helpful resources. Even if you aren't able to go to the conferences because of COVID, there are still tons of resources on their website. There are uh, mentorship programs, remote mentorship programs. There are guides to looking for jobs. There are internship listings, all kinds of things. And if you can get hooked up with a mentor through one of the professional societies, that can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. Charlie Nyland um, at University of Missouri was my mentor through Ecological Society of America and absolutely a transformative experience and incredibly helpful in setting me on my way. So I would say that type of connection to professional societies and then sort of that sits within the context of broader relationship building. You know, during COVID conversation doesn't stop, right? And so you can still be reaching out to folks in your field who you have done work with or hoping to do work with. You can be exploring peer groups. You can be doing all kinds of things to, to keep touch with folks who are in your field that, and keep touch in ways that really demonstrates I intend to be a part of the professional world that you inhabit, right? And that's what I'm working toward and, and this is how I'm getting there. So I would suggest this. Good, thank you. That's very good insight. Sherry, you wanted to say something? 
I, I just wanted to say, when you go to career fairs, don't just give the people there your information, take their cards as well. And you can always reach out to them and say, hey, here's my resume. Is there anything that's open that, you know, I made internships, uh, volunteer opportunities to help me develop the skills I need in order to become a professional in your agency? continue to reach out to them. Don't just let it be a one-way conversation where they are reaching out to you and sending you your information. It's your life. You need to reach out to them and say, I'm available. Let me know what I can do to uh, increase my uh, chances of getting into this agency and working with you. That, that's and a, and go I'll, ahead, I'll agree with that. I've, I, you know, I, when, I, when I attended attend career fairs I, I pass out my cards to almost everybody and, and I say you know call me I, I'm, I'm willing to help my fellow Rammies you know I'll, I'll meet you out for 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 a, you know a happy hour we can grab a beer we can go get coffee and you could just pick my brain and quite a few people have done it and and I've, I've and I've maintained relationships and, and I've gotten um, applications from them and they you know haven't necessarily hired directly but I know that that a majority of the people that have followed up with me and, and then met and, and, and had more one-on-one -on -one interactions have uh, gone on to uh, gainful employment, if you will. So it, that, take advantage of it, just like Sherry said. Um, I'm gonna chime in real quick and just say that all of that that was just said was so extremely relevant because um, Alexandra was talking about all of the um, professional societies and stuff. And I got my start with my job with manners. I got it at the conference and I was a sophomore in college. I had no idea what I was doing, but a fish and wildlife service person saw how I was dressed, saw how I was like carrying myself. And he was like, you're pretty cool. You seem really professional and really smart. I want to give you an internship right now. And I was like, okay. So I still talk to that mentor all the time. In fact, I'm, he was he's texting me right now to check in to see how I'm doing with COVID and stuff. So those connections that you make through student organizations, professional societies, career fairs, um, like Jeremy was saying, just like go to a happy hour, like get to know them on a personal level so that you create that strong connection where you can keep using them as a resource later because it works really well. And from that first internship I had, I created connections with more fish and wildlife service people that gave me my second internship that gave me non-competitive status to get into this job. So all of that was just like so relevant and I could not agree more to just like keep making those connections and join those societies and clubs and stuff. Wow, well thank you for sharing that because I think that goes right in hand and I think Sherry you hit on a nerve right there because you know, um, quite frankly, you know, the, the sometimes this generation i'll be wondering do they have the same drive to go get the job sometimes it's just submit the resume and then they wait for people to call and uh, one thing that i'm hearing from um, yourself michaela and jeremy is that um, for the students listening today you have to remember we are we're, we're established in our careers now we're are we're you know we're becoming more established and we have contacts and so it's my duty and it's in my responsibility to try to put you in contact with as many different touch points to give you the best employment or assistance opportunity uh, possible. And it's amazing how many times I'll reach out to some students or if I'm at a conference and I give my card out, reach out to me, let me know how I can help. And they don't realize the connections that we have as, empl uh, as employees within our own fields, right? And um, just thinking about how this came together, which is the connections that the employees at CSU has to say, hey, we wanted to make sure that we bring in a conversation that's going to be relevant for our students. But sometimes they don't capitalize on that. So I catch myself sometimes having to follow up with students. Did you submit that email? Did you submit a follow-up email? Did you turn in your cover letter? Did you? And so I'm so glad for you all to hear um, other people outside the college saying the same thing that you have to be aggressive and uh, per, uh, persistent in what you want. And um, is, don't take it as a slight that um, it might take a week or two for someone to respond back to you because we're busy and we all have a different, you know, we have different responsibilities and sometimes emails do get lost. And I'm sure just like everybody else on this panel, 
Um, I can get anywhere between 150 to 250 emails a day. And so sometimes those emails get lost, but um, if you follow up with me, that helps me make sure that you're in front of mind to make sure that we can help you as a student because as students, we wanna make sure you're successful because then we're successful as a college. So definitely utilize the skills here. So sorry, I had on my, I wasn't supposed to be talking, but that was Sherry's fault. She, she hit a nerve. All right, um, <laughs> so uh, the last question is this, and then we're gonna transition more to a diversity focused conversation. Um, because of COVID, a lot of the natural resource professions that we have and a lot of the skills that we teach are very much tied to having an immersive experience, very tangible, in-person, in-depth, in the field, you know, groups and stuff like that. And COVID has really put a wrench in that practice of working in teams, working hands-on in the field, working hands-on uh, in various areas. How is your organization looking at the challenges that COVID is providing currently and adapting to that if this is to sustain and go on even longer within the natural resource fields? And again, this is a popcorn question, so anybody who wants to chime in can chime in. I'll chime in. Um, so we're doing a lot of teleworking and uh, since we're like a conservation agency, we have a lot of field folks that were primarily um, on the ground in the field, never on their computers. So something that we did was um, get all of the programs together and we created a list of tasks that the field folks could do on their computers to ensure that they still um, got like 40 hours a week. And it was just like little things like going through the pictures that they took in the field and uploading them to our Flickr page or um, thinking about potential social media posts or writing stories about cool things that they did in the field. So we came up with a lot of things that they wouldn't traditionally do. Um, also offering like leadership trainings and offering like leadership books, anything that can build them up, like build up their skills and things. So um, we're just really opening up a lot of opportunities to make sure that everyone is still getting their hours and um, having opportunities to grow. And then with hiring, we're still hiring people and we're just letting them work from home and finding more things for them to do. So it's actually been working out pretty well. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll chime I'll in. Chime in. Okay, oh, wait, sorry, go ahead, Sherry. Nope, Jeremy, you're fine. Okay, um, <laughs> Zoom, Zoom is a, suddenly becomes a very great tool. And I had never even before this all started, I, you know, I maybe had heard of Zoom a little bit. And now it's, it's a, it's a, it's a thing with everything. Obviously, we're on Zoom right now. And it, uh, I, you know, we're, I'm conducting many meetings, day in, day out via Zoom. And it's, uh, it's interesting. And, and I always have that disclaimer of, well, you know, I might have a cat walk by in the background or, or a screaming kid come in, but that's part of the new normal, I suppose. Um, and I think that, you know, how my company is handling this pandemic it might be a little bit uh different because i'm i'm uh kind of I'm, I'm an independent uh not government associated um company and and to be honest it's hitting us hard um you know we have uh engineering projects that are in progress and and, and geological projects that are in progress that um the funding's already been there so we're we're still working but it's the the the, the projects that are not coming in right now um, is, is, is taking a hit and, and, and my company with, and, and with lots of other companies that we're just evaluating how we're going to proceed through this. Um, and, and that's kind of the nature of the consulting industry is it ebbs and flows. And so, so whatever happens in this short term is not going to be in the long term because, uh, consulting, you know, you know, I'm sure that, that, that my fellow panelists can agree. I mean, the world goes on, the work goes on, it'll, it, it needs to happen. And once we find out what the new normal is, it'll start happening again. Thank you. Sherry, I'm gonna let you speak. Hold on one second. Uh, just a reminder to those in attendance right now that you can ask questions as we're going through. If you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you will have a Q&A uh, icon that you can click on and type in your questions and those questions will go straight to the panelists. Um, all at once so we can see what the question is. So if you have a question based on anyone's uh, responses, feel free to type in your questions there and we'll address your questions at that time. Um, so just making sure everyone is aware of that. All right, go ahead, Sherry. Um, the Forest Service is still onboarding their seasonal and permanent uh, employees right now. 
We are doing orientation, this virtual orientation. We are hosting um, like Ag Learn training. There's trainings that you can do online while you're transitioning into the agency. Your background checks and everything are being uh, conducted at this time. So we are still onboarding and bringing people on uh, as we speak during this COVID pandemic. And we are also providing meaningful work for you guys. You, you can review all of the directives and guidelines for the jobs that you're working on, that you're going to be working in, which will give you a better understanding of what you're doing when you do get back to the field. There are essential employees that are working. A law enforcement officer has not stopped working. And so there are opportunities out there for you to do work and continue to be hired on as the pandemic is uh, going on. We have supervisors doing check-in for uh, virtual work and computer work while you're teleworking during these times. So we're still hiring and we're still onboarding um, just in a different way now. So please do feel free to apply for the jobs and continue to reach out to your supervisor and ask for opportunities that may not be the normal within your job, but something that you can do within natural resources that you can learn differently so that you can apply those skills when um, this pandemic or is over or we get back to our normal. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so now we're going to kind of transition to, to oh, someone will go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry, okay. I didn't see you. I'll be quick. Um, so I would say that, so uh, during COVID, things are not super normal for us. Uh, being a nonprofit, you know, we have to be really thoughtful about where our funding comes from now and in the future. So we have in anticipation of not really COVID itself, but kind of the fallout from COVID and what happens over the next 12 months, we actually do have a hiring freeze on right now. And so we paused our summer internship program. We will pick it up again next year. But in the meantime, we are continuing to do a lot of social media work. We obviously can't do as much grassroots and in the community work as we used to, but we are leaning heavily into our information providing roles, leaning heavily into our advocacy roles, our, our sort of um, digital organizing roles and things like that. And so those are, there are ways of still meeting our goals and pursuing the, the things that we want to see happen without being able to do it in person. And I think that kind of speaks back to the flexibility and the adaptability that we encourage students to cultivate earlier in the conversation. And I actually want to just add a tiny little thing to that, which is that it occurred to me something that is really appealing for folks who are interested in going into the nonprofit space is get a grant, win a grant, when you are a student, even if it's $400, $300, something that demonstrates that you are able, uh, able to seek support for things that you want to see happen and that you're able to manage uh, funding when you do get it. Good deal. You know, that's, yeah, if you can get money, you can make money. That's, that's the model right there. Get money, you can make money. Uh, anyone else want to add? Okay, good. Um, thank you so so much for uh, the five of you participating. Um, this very much aligns with the five participants yesterday who uh, chimed in some things. And so we're going to transition to um, the diversity topics now. And so uh, one of the reasons why we held this panel and this webinar is because uh, when you think about natural resources, there's a lot of uh, visual stereotypes, uh, mental stereotypes, and just uh, misconceptions. Uh, one of them obviously being that diverse talent and, and students of color and individuals of color are not interested in natural resource fields. Uh, for those who are identified as a diverse or underrepresented student, there's the belief that uh, they can't make it to a high position of influence or leadership. And um, all of you all today and, and the panelists yesterday are testaments against that, that notion. And so thank you for showing, showing up for that. Um, but when we think about diversity, what diversity initiatives in your organization are you currently working on and why are those important? And how are you inclusive with the underserved communities? Again, this is a popcorn, so anybody can chime in. Sure, I will jump in again. Uh, so, um, so a couple of things. Uh, so one is that it's really difficult for me to talk about diversity as being a separate set of work. It's really deeply imbued into all of the work that I do. Like I mentioned before, my role is to find the places that matter and help protect those places. And the question of where matters is inherently a question of who's asked, right? And so by looking, by even 
doing this type of work, I am inherently tasked with reaching out to, spending time with, developing authentic and meaningful relationships with multiple different diverse communities so that what I come out with when I say these are the places that matters really genuinely represents what the people around me and the people who share this space are feeling and isn't just a reflection of historical bias or some cool movie that someone saw one time and thought was the, you know, the way to do things or whatever it is. Um, no shade to cool movies. I know we got some. <laughs> but you know. But um, but I think that it is it is really about in every step of the work asking ourselves the questions of what are we doing? Why are we doing it? How are we doing it? How do we know that what we're doing is right or isn't hurting others? And who are we asking? And so I I find that imbued into all parts of my work. That's really part of my organizational culture. I, one of the things I love about working for the Wilderness Society is that it is an incredibly progressive organization in ways that really align with my personal integrity, my personal goals. It is an organization that is not just about saying we care about diversity, but about authentically investing in putting money, putting time into communities that have not historically had their voices amplified. And so I, that is kind of how it plays out. And in a day-to-day -day sense, what does that mean? It means that for me here in the Southeast, I am working on, for example, a project around the Great Dismal Swamp. If you do not know the Dismal, it is one of the coolest places in America and I highly recommend visiting. It is a now fairly small swamp of about 110,000 acres that was a million acres when George Washington first wrote about it and was probably even bigger than that when the Nansemond first began using it as their hunting grounds and as trade routes. It is a place that is the only water bound stop on the Underground Railroad that we know of. It was home to incredible maroon colonies of people who were uh, fugitives from enslavement and lived in the swamp for generations. It was also the hunting grounds and trade grounds of Meharan, the Hollow Saponi, and um, possibly the Choan as well. And so there is just this incredibly rich cultural history that exists in that place. And I think in a different conservation organization, the way it would be approached is to say, the swamp is ecologically important, therefore we should make a park out of it, or we should put some additional protection on it. In my way of working, it's, I think the swamp is important and here's why. Now let me go into all these communities that I know have ties to the swamp ancestrally and ask them whether they think it's important. And if so, what parts? And if so, and why those parts? What does it mean to you? And how can I support what you would like to see in the form of protection for this place? And kind of out of that, draw a, a solution that is more collaborative that springs up and becomes a big umbrella for everyone. So I think that's just about it. Thank you so much. I just got a history lesson. I, I don't know where the swamp is located. You didn't tell me where the swamp was located. Where's the swamp I located? I didn't tell you where the swamp is located. It's right on the Virginia, North Carolina border. So it is uh, right in between the Chesapeake Bay and the Albemarle Sound. And it actually, fun uh, colonial fact about it, it has a canal that was dug by enslaved laborers through the middle of it. It's the longest functioning. It still operates as a trade canal. It's the longest functioning canal in the United States. So you oh, can wow. still move goods up from North Carolina to Maryland that way if you really want. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, anyone else? What the question was, what diversity initiatives is your organization currently working on and why are those important? And how are you uh, inclusive with underserved communities uh, based through your organization? Uh, Crystal, you want to chime in? I, I'll, I'll chime in real quick. Okay, uh, you know, it's in? just, you know, as a corporate initiative, we we uh, have a, a, a diversity. Um, uh, I, I forget the word, like not club, but like like group that 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 changes year by year, and and it, it encompasses it's corporate wide. It encompasses everybody from um, all various you know regions and ethnicities and and and, and everything, and 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 it it. Uh, what we do is we, we we make sure that 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 our initiatives are aligned with how the people within our company feel, and so that's why it changes year by year, and 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 we always have new initiatives and make sure that we're just kind of up to up to speed on things. And and then I will give a uh, kind of a specific kind of uh, project specific uh, item that we we work on is we work a lot with the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, on. Uh, rehabilitating and evaluating their their dam infrastructure and they have there's a lot of dams out here in the west that are that are 
um, poor to say the least um, in quality and, 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 and longevity just because it's so old. And, and we've been working with, with the BIA to, to help specific tribes inspect and then uh, design and actually help them construct um, to, to facilitate employment within the tribes to help them build their own dams, repair their own dams. And then we've also trained them to do the dam inspections and the, the, the yearly or bi-yearly or, or whatever monitoring that, that we would normally do where we're training them to do that on their own. So that's a kind of a projects company specific item. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Crystal. So I'll be honest, I guess. <laughs> A um, little bit nervous, but um, I'm going to be honest and say that our organization, it's not a huge focus for a lot of people. Um, there are individuals working on diversity, equity, and inclusivity um, at all levels, but it's not really an organized effort. And I'm not by any means the only one or the best one or anything like that but there is starting to be this like um this surge of people realizing that um they can go to dei trainings and do webinars and read books and it's like just starting to um to awaken the minds of 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 some folks however uh there is a lot of um, the attitude of like, well, the outdoors is for everybody, you know, it's, so it's always been for everybody. And so it is honestly really hard to do the work to try and explain and, you know, so that people understand. And, and, and a lot of times people ask, um, you know, me or somebody else from a marginalized identity or um you know about this and so it is really important to for me to try to get across to everybody that there are resources out there online there's books there's people who are literally experts in in these discussions and there's tons of resources that you can do to self-educate on the historical context of why diversity in um you know, hiring in organizations or just being outside or being, you know, a birder, like why diversity in those things any, in any level is important. Um, and uh, yeah, so I would just say like, to be honest, our agency hasn't really gotten there yet, but there are a lot of people um, as individuals doing, doing good, awesome work. Uh, for example, our uh, fishing outreach coordinator is of Latin descent and he does a lot of Hispanic and Latinx um, fishing clinics that are just solely in Spanish. He's a uniformed uh, commissioned officer but he does not wear his um, officer apparel to those you know and so a lot of individuals are doing things like that um, and acknowledging that but then there is a lot of people who don't understand you know how a uniformed officer could possibly be perceived by by some communities like they just don't even get it um so yeah it's a little bit hard but yeah <laughs> Well, thank you, and that's and that's that's real for some organizations where it's a constant uh, discussion of, of progress and work. And so, hopefully, what our students is hearing is that uh, the education and the impetus of diversity and inclusion that you're receiving at Warner helps you be prepared to be a change a change agent at some of these organizations to help foster and champion this new growth and direction to, uh, for some of these organizations that are reaching out and trying to better understand how does their organization adapt and adapt to the, uh, the changing demographics, the perspectives and engagement of natural resources with certain communities, et cetera. So that's a very real and authentic uh, take on that. Christmas. Yeah, I will say too that um, for me personally, a lot of people tell me like, oh, this work isn't your job, you know, it's not your responsibility. And it's not my responsibility to be part of this change in this movement to like help the agency culture change and sh or shift, I should say. But it is actually a passion of mine that as somebody with a free creative license in my video and marketing work, I can be 
the spearhead to show the public to the public like you know all my work is very public facing and has people in it so what i could do is try to figure out ways to um not tokenize not um you know use people but in an authentic way share the stories of real people who are out there or in our agency doing this work um, so it's not everybody uh, who's from a marginalized identity's responsibility to do this. There's many people in our agency who are people of color, part of the LGBTQ community, who are like, no way, I'm staying out of it. I'm just going to do my my job A that I was hired for. But um, that's that's just not me. <laughs> that's not me. So um, yeah, I just wanted to make that clear that you don't have to, <laughs> you know, take that up. But I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, anyone else want to take on that question before I go to the next one? Can't. <clears throat> the Forest Service is is moving. We've we've had the inclusion transition um, movement for a while, and we're doing actually really good with bringing in diverse candidates. The thing that I want the students to understand is because the agency embraces it, doesn't mean the community that you're gonna live in is going to embrace it. And that's some, those are some of the challenges I've had when I've lived in communities where I'm the only person that looked like me, well, the only color that I am. And also when I have students to come and work for me, uh, these are the challenges they face when they're in these communities. Yes, the agency has embraced it. We are, we are hiring more diverse people. We're including everyone. But being that the Forest Service, for the majority of it, unless you're in a regional office, you're going to be in these very remote small towns where people have never had any physical interaction with anyone other than everything they've seen on television about you and, or your people or your, the, the, the people that look like you. That's what they're going to think you know, have in their head is who you are. Um, one town I went to, they thought I was Vanessa Huxtable. Can you believe that? So I was like, yeah, no, I'm not the Cosby kid, but thank you for considering. But there's something you're going to have to deal with uh, when you're in a federal agency and you're going to be in these remote areas is to keep that in mind. Uh, try not to be offended by it. And they're going to ask a lot of questions and, you know, they may even not talk to you, but make sure that you are open to putting yourself out there, at least trying to to mingle with the, with the people in the town because these small close-knit towns, they are very close and they don't like outsiders. I don't care what color you are. You can look just like them and they're still not gonna welcome you in. So just be aware of those things. Even though the agency may be embracing inclusion and diversity, the small communities you're gonna be working in may not um, accept it as well, as fast as we would hope they would. So just be uh, prepared for those obstacles that you're going to be faced with. Thank you, Sherry. And based off of that, I want to kind of go right back to you on this question, which was asked uh, yesterday from some students, which was, um, if they are the only person uh, of identity, so color, gender, religion, um, how does the company or how does the organization support them knowing that they might be having to start their entry level position in some very real places as you just described. How does the organization therefore support those students through that development or those new employees through that development uh, when they are the only one in isolation in a very rural area? I'm going right back to you, Sherry. Yeah. Okay. And so when I had the students to come to me and they were, you know, in town i had two students from atlanta to come to minnesota and the the people there is like oh can i touch your hair oh you're so pretty you know can i touch your skin and those type things for me is i had to take it on myself to introduce the students to the community these are students they're here for this reason you know ha ask any questions if you see them out you know Welcome yourself, talking to the communities, getting them involved with the Chamber of Commerce, meeting with partners that were um, accustomed to a diverse group of people and having to deal with them was helpful when we had to have students to come into places where they're the only 
people of that, making sure that they attend meetings with you, making sure that the employees of the agency are aware and most employees are, and to make them feel welcome. And if they don't, then they have someone they can come and talk to about these issues so that they will feel that they're being hurt. And if they're harassed, and students have been harassed in some of the areas, and we've had to remove students from these you know, difficult places where they were, and just making sure you're communicating what's going on, documenting with your supervisor. And if you're feeling threatened or if you feel that you're not going to be able to work there, work with your supervisor on that. And then they can provide you a safe haven or even remove you from that situation and put you somewhere where you'll feel a lot safer. Thank you. Anyone else would like to chime in on that? Uh, for my job, I travel around to a lot of really rural Colorado areas, and there's actually some places where I won't go. And I've never told people like openly like, oh, this is where I'm not going. I just kind of like avoid it. Um, I have the luxury of that not being placed in one specific small town, but in my travels, um, if I feel uncomfortable going to a town, I actually uh, call our local wildlife officer out there and ask them to come with me to make introductions, like if I'm going to a landowner. Um, a lot of people don't assume I'm a person of color when speaking to me over the phone, so um, when I, especially working for Colorado Parks and Wildlife, which is perceived as very white male, because <laughs> it is, and um, so when I show up, people, people have been really surprised, and so if I do feel unsafe, I actually just call, like, the local wildlife officer, or um, if I know of somebody else higher that's, like, a really well-respected member of the community or is involved with the community, I actually just ask them to go with me for the first introductions to, you know, a private landowner or, or a business that I'm going to, and uh, a lot of people don't understand why. Um, and that's really hard to try to explain as well and exhausting to explain, but I just do it. I just, it, you know, uh, I don't need to explain it to everybody. So. <laughs> right. Right. That's very real. Uh, anyone else before we go into our next question? I do not have an answer. I'm actually jumping in to say that I am sorry to say that I have a hard stop for uh, another engagement, but it has been lovely being on a panel with all of you. And Ricky, Vicki, thank you both for this opportunity. So nice to meet you all. And if students have any other questions, uh, feel free to share my email and have them email me. Yes, ma'am. Before you get off, can you provide this one thing? And I'll lead it off and you can start this question. Sure. Imagine you are a student watching this own panel today. What yeah. advice would you give yourself knowing that you're watching it as a student? Based on all your lived experiences and where you're at now, what advice would you give yourself as a student watching this panel today? Um, okay, so maybe not exactly a reaction to the panel per se, but right, if yes. there is a piece of advice that I found really useful when I was a student, it's um, generally through my life, I've always tried to have a thing like a load star, a, a thing that I believe in that helps me make decisions when decisions are hard. And so one of my load stars is that I never believe anything that makes me weak. So when I find myself wanting to do something or considering doing something and saying, ah, I don't know if I can, or feeling a sense of self-doubt, then I ask myself what it is that I, have, that I am believing that makes me weak. And then I just get rid of it. And that has been a way that I have continued to press forward and do things, even if they were uncertain or scary or unknown or whatever. Bravery is a virtue, kids. So I think that's probably what I would tell myself as a student. Well, all right, well, all right then. Mic drop and we'll see you later. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Um, anyone me. else? If you had to give advice to yourself as a student watching this, what would you give your advice? What would you say? I'll chime in. I would say utilize your, utilize Ricky. He has the connections. He connected all of us together. He knows the people to, to, to get you the jobs. And also for those connections with your professors, they are in tune with the people that are in the industries that are working. Get to know your faculty and, and utilize that and also 
talk to them about what's going on in the with the agencies. How do you feel about these? Get their feedback on what agency or what um, particular field or people you company you would want to work with. They are there to help you. They are there for you. And that's the one thing I did when I was in school. I reached out to my professors and uh, colleagues of theirs and, and, and realized that, hey, they do know something and they do have something to offer. And that's how I got um, my first job with the Department of Agriculture and Forestry in urban forestry. So reach out to your faculty, your staff, to the directors of natural resources and make sure that you're communicating with them what your plans are and they will reach out to the agencies and to the companies to get you um, hired on and to make sure that you're going to be gainfully employed and really set up for a successful future in natural resources. And Thank thanks you. for that question, Ricky. No problem. Jeremy? Yeah, I'll say, I'll say, you know, listen to all these panelists take take their advice they we all these panelists have been been through what you're going through um we're, we've forged our own way and we're doing doing things our own way and we're, we're here to help and, and and take advantage of more of these types of, of of offerings that that the the department and the school offer because you know it, it's real it's real life stuff and it, and it helps it, it participating in stuff like this uh, immediately gives you a leg up uh, over people who, who don't participate. Okay. Uh, Michaela. So I would say something that I struggled with, um, it took me a couple years to figure it out, but if you want to achieve something that you think is out of your grasp, or if you have a really big idea that you just think is super, it's like not realistic and you don't speak up about it, chances are if you do speak up about it you have the resources and the people and the staff and faculty at warner that can make that happen um it took leanna biddle was like a huge mentor for me in school still is i still talk to her i can't tell you how many times i was like leanna i have this idea and i think i want to do it but i don't think i can and i'm scared to talk in front of people and it took so much convincing <laughs> to just make me do it. So just like have that drive, have that confidence in yourself that whatever your ideas are, whatever you want to achieve, you will most likely be able to do it, especially if you have people behind you that will support you and make sure that you're on the road to success. Yeah, uh, Crystal. Um, so I, I would tell myself to, to that it's okay to be true to myself and my values earlier on in my career. I think I did a lot of trying to conform to, to the people around me, um, but in, in order to fit in, because, you know, I did stand out. I'm really, really silly and goofy. I skipped down the hallway, all that stuff. I'm saying like be professional, um, you know, in, in meetings and all that, but people can tell when you're not being your authentic self. And if, unless you're an asshole, don't be, don't do that. <laughs> uh, like, don't be a jerk, but um, you know, like bring, bring yourself uh, to your work. And if people don't like it or appreciate it, then that's not the place for you anyway. You know, uh, start looking for another job. And it's not, it's not your responsibility to conform to the organization you work with. You should find somewhere that like naturally suits you. Um, my organization is pretty conservative, but yet they are super accepting of me, super accepting of my silliness. You know, I'm always playing with like a Rubik's cube at meetings or something, but like under the table, you know, like just be yourself, be professional um but you know stay true to to those values i also learned very early on that when i stood up for something that was wrong people actually respected me more for that um there's a couple situations um not at colorado parks and wildlife earlier in my career where i saw people trying to break like uh, employment laws union laws um and i stood up and i said something and after that uh, uh people actually respected me i still got promoted so and you know and if they don't after that again that's not somewhere you want to work is it 
So, um, yeah, sorry I cursed, but... Um, <laughs> Authentic um, self. Stay, stay true, stay true to yourself also while being professional. <laughs> Yeah. No, you're fine. Thank you, Crystal. Um, the very last question is the question that um, I want to be mindful for our students because I know our students are typically like are asking a lot of these questions are geared towards what they need to do better to be prepared for the situation. But the very last question I have before we open it up for our questions uh, by our students is, what is one thing that you think colleges, Warner College can do better to prepare students or should we be focusing on to better align our students now for employment in the future. And anybody can jump in, it's popcorn, so. I would say maybe just a little bit more employment oriented um, classes. It's, it's hard for me to say exactly, but maybe a little bit, uh, geared more towards the 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 real world real world once we get out there um you know what that is i don't know but a little bit more of that would would is something i would say okay. Thank but you. I, I graduated a, many many years ago too so <laughs> maybe things have changed a little bit since then anyone else i have something this is this is going to be kind of like sad, but um, something I experienced quite a few times was um, having some professors and like other people uh, ask me what I wanted to do and like what my goal career was. And when I told them like I wanted to do communications and like graphic design and stuff specifically to communicate conservation, natural resources, wildlife and stuff like that. And there were multiple times that I was told that that job didn't exist and that I would need to reevaluate what I wanted to do. And I have that job now <laughs> that I wanted. So um, I would say something that would be cool to see is to just like encourage the students um to just like go for their goals and kind of like not shoot that down i i'm not sure if that's uh how it is now still but i know that that was definitely rough for me to hear but then i, I just kind of like brushed it off and i was like that has to exist and it did but um yeah i think encouragement and like if if they do hear something that's kind of out of the box to so just be like well how can we make that happen or how can we help you research into finding that position that you're interested in thank you uh, to echo Michaela, yeah, that, that brings me back to my first point is like there's so many jobs within natural resources and conservation. Yes. I mean, I went to film school, you know, <laughs> uh, but if you are a natural resources minded person, there's so many jobs like Michaela just said that um, we, we really want people with that background, that connection to conservation, to, to parks and land and, you know, wildlife um, to do any of the jobs, you know, even if it's a real estate lawyer, you know, so it can only help. So it's not like when you go to that school, you have to then become a biologist or a park ranger. You can still do so many other things and it just makes you better for us. Very much so. And I'm glad you said that because that's very true. Uh, Sherry. Okay, I think you guys can do um, job shadow opportunities for the students for them to get some real time uh, experience and see what the job actually is instead of saying because um, a lot of students like you said in the past they think they're going to come in in junior executive positions because they have a bachelor's or a master's degree even a phd degree and that's not going to happen so having opportunities for job shadowing for the companies that the students would work, that they would like to pursue a career in, I think that would be helpful for them to get a firsthand experience and opportunity um, to work with these, up with these employees to see the day-to-day -day work and how it is to actually work in a nine, eight to five, eight to four, thirty uh, position. Because these jobs are real and they have these criteria that you must make and meet. And I think that having that opportunity for the students would be helpful to, for them to, to really get a, a better understanding of, of, of how uh, the workforce is. Thank you. 
Um, so there we have it. That's uh, all the questions that we had uh, the, uh, for the panelists. And now I'd like to open it up uh, to the students. So at this time, I, I think Vicky's gonna open it up for our students. For the students listening, you can look at the bottom of your screen and where it says Q&A, you can click on that and type in your question. It could be a general question. If you have a question specifically for a panelist, you can put their name down so that we know who to target the question to. Um, so as that's opening up, just a reminder, this is day two. So we did have a day one uh, discussion yesterday um, that's already posted on our uh, Warner YouTube page. So if you missed yesterday's uh, session, feel free to look at the Warner YouTube page and that'll be posted up there. Uh, it should be able to post up there today, if not by today, uh, by next week for sure, we'll have these two discussions posted. Um, if any of these panelists uh, uh, fancied your interest uh, specifically, or if there's some people that fancied your interest yesterday, you can look at their names. We, on our flyers, we have their name and their organization. Feel free to reach out to these individuals and send them a personal email about how they can help you, or if you have a specific question for them that you uh, might not want to ask today publicly, in front of the group, that's fine as well. So at this point, I'm gonna give about a couple of minutes to see what kind of questions we have coming in. Uh, again, thank you all to the panels for taking out uh, some of your time for the, today to uh, share your knowledge and your wisdom. Again, uh, we see that natural resources is a vast industry that allows a lot of different pathways of growth and of development, but also opportunities for uh, to make a unique identity for yourself and to thrive in your profession and tie it back to your community so that uh, we enrich humanity and understanding how we intersect with natural resources holistically. So again, thank you all for your time. And at this moment, I'm just gonna wait about 30 seconds to see if we have any questions come in. Oh, we have, here we got one. So first question is, hello, uh, my name is Shabria and I'm a graduating senior that identifies as African-American with pronouns she, her, and hers. I have a question that anybody could feel free to answer. Would you recommend that applicants who value increasing diversity and inclusion primarily apply for jobs where the organization already has a focus on those values? Or should they try to get into spaces where a diversity deficit, with a diversity deficit in order to increase that, that DNI that is lacking? That's a very good question, Shabria. Good question. Hello, <laughs> Shilbrea. Um, so I, one of the things that I kind of um, alluded to before is that we're, we're working on increasing diversity and creating that, that welcoming space. Um, one of the things we ran into is the responsibility that falls on an organization um, to trying to increase their diversity or be, become more diverse. Well, what happens when those people get here? You know, what kind of support do they have? What kind of resources do they have? What kind of reporting system do we have so that we're not just, um, you know, putting their feet to the fire um, just so that we check a box, you know? And so I think if you do apply to places where there is a diversity deficit, um, you know, people might question like, oh, were you hired just because of X, Y, Z? People ask me that all the time, and I'm just like, I'm good at my job. I, you know, maybe I don't care. Like, why do I care? I'm good at my job. Like, what? I don't think about that at night. You know, um, everybody has a different um, personal response to that, and that's okay. But um, yeah, I would say if you apply to somewhere that does have a diversity deficit, be ready um, for them to start as like show abuse. Getting up. Uh, be ready for them to not exactly be prepared to support you and make sure that you do have that support somewhere else. Uh, I've discovered a community, uh, the conservationists of color community, um, and that's a great place or, you know, one friend or a group of friends and um, make sure you have people that you can, can talk to about the issues um, because it might not be the place you're working. <laughs> Uh, thank you for that, Crystal. Anyone else would like to chime in on that question? Okay. Seeing no more, um, I'll wait another 10, 15 seconds to see if there's any other additional questions coming through. Um, it's typically right when I'm about to close, there'll be that last question that comes right at the very end, right when I'm about to make the closing remarks. So fly in, so I'm just gonna wait. 
10 more seconds. Okay, well, thank you all for uh, participating. For the students that are watching again, thank you. If you uh, have a question that you prefer to ask more discreetly one-on-one, -on -one, feel free to uh, reach out to these individuals today. You have their contact information with the flyer that we posted. Um, if you need help in knowing how to address some of these individuals from today or yesterday, uh, feel free to reach out to myself or Leanne Bildel. Uh, that was mentioned earlier uh, from Michaela, who we can provide resources on how to uh, start that conversation as well. So again, this was day two. It's been very successful. We see that out of the 10, we have uh, seven uh, females, uh, three males that participated. We had uh, out of the 10, a very diverse panel. So to let you realize that, you know, um, there's opportunities out there for anyone who's interested and there's ways for anyone who's participating and listening today to be a champion and an advocate, not only for natural resource professions, but also for diversity and inclusion intersected with natural resource professions. So again, thank you for your time and have a great, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.